Um, are we starting? Are we, are we, are we recording it by this? Yes. Okay, we, so we can tell. Okay. Would you like to have the chair? Should I sit for a second yes. so that I can? <laughs> okay, everything, everything. Oh my goodness. Let's start. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Fabio Rossi, and I'm a uh, director uh, a principal of the gallery, Rossi Rossi. Welcome to this Zoom talk. It's our first ever Zoom talk, so it's exciting to to be doing it today um, on the occasion of Elisa Sigicelli exhibition at the gallery. The exhibition is called Stone Talk and it's Elisa's first exhibition in solo exhibition in Asia. And she'd be in conversation with Susanna McFadden, uh, who is um, Hong Kong, a professor, a history professor at Hong Kong University here in Hong Kong. Um, and they did, will discuss their views on uh, Roman art and culture, exploring the idea of beauty in relation to the body in the Greek or Roman world, as, the, as well as the material used both in ancient times and the parallel scene in the contemporary works of Elisa. Uh, I'll give just a brief introduction to both of them. Um, Elisa Sigicelli is known for her installation-based studies of um, objects and their relationship to space. She is exhibited internationally and her works can be seen in notable institution collection uh, all over the world. She's based in her hometown of Turin, which happens to be my hometown too. And she studied textile design in Florence before finishing her undergraduate degree at Kingston University in London and later received her Master of Arts at the Slade School of Fine Art also in London. Um, and so, uh, going to, um, she's going to, and this, as I say, is the first ever exhi exhibition in Asia. So we're very excited to bring her work to the audience here. Um, Elisa was supposed to be here with us, but of course she's here virtually. So from a wonderful studio in Torino. Uh, here in the room, we have Dr. Susanna McFadden, who is a specialist in the art, architecture, and archaeology of the Greco-Roman and late antique Mediterranean with a particular emphasis on the medium of wall painting. Prior to joining the faculty of Hong Kong University, she taught art and archaeology, archaeology at Bryn Mawr, I hope I pronounced it right, <laughs> college, Fordham University and the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania is much in the news today. Wow. <laughs> Great, yeah, Philadelphia, fantastic, good job. <laughs> Dr. McFadden has authored several articles and book chapters on late Roman world painting in Rome and Egypt, and her current book project focuses on the visual culture of late Roman Egypt and explore the sp spatial, ritual, and material dynamics of wall paintings in the ancient Mediterranean large. Um, I'm gonna leave the chair to Susanna. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you both. And um, I hope you, everyone enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction to, um, this is so strange because I can't see the audience at all. So um, I guess because this is just- You're so frozen. Oh no, I have frozen. Oh, no, 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 now you're moving again. All right. Um, so this is, this is such a, a fun opportunity for, for me to have a conversation uh, with a contemporary artist. And it's so exciting, especially because the more I look at your work and the more um, I learn about your technique, I, I'm so struck by um, the connectedness between past and present um, and the way in which, uh, you know, you might not even realize that you're tapping into sort of um, trends that artists would themselves have, have tapped into uh, in the past. Um, and just li listening to Fabio's uh, description of your experience, I, I didn't know that you had studied textiles, um, but that actually makes so much sense to me because we've talked, we, uh, for the audience, Elisa and I actually had a chance to talk a little bit um, about a week ago, just to get a sense of, of, of what we're gonna talk about now. And I, we, we talked about the, the multi-sensory and the sort of um, uh, multi-material materiality aspect of, of your work. Um, so, you know, I see that now thinking about your training with textiles also. And, and that's something that I'm really interested in my own work, especially, which is kind of fun. Um, I'm working on um, you know, some, some wall paintings in, in late antiquity that are, um, uh, that are that are are tapping into uh, the viewer's great delight in 
kind of intermateriality, you know, this idea that, that um, one material can evoke another or fool our eyes into thinking it's something else. Um, so I, 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 want, I thought, I mean, I don't know if you want to start out with any particular question, but I really wanted to hear more about your process, sort of yeah. how, you, um, how you got to these fantastic um, um, works that, that, that really defy um, our understanding of a particular material. Yes. Well, I have to say that I work quite um, intuitively. So sometimes I um, might think of a subject matter and I uh, take photographs and then I think of a material or sometimes I, I think of a material and then look for a, a subject matter, um, it depends. The, the basic idea is that um, I want to give photographs um, a new materiality. I want to make them tangible in space. So they inhabit the, the same space as the viewer. So uh, as, as you pointed out, they are meant to be um, experienced you know, with, with your senses. Many works you might want to um, to touch them or the works on satin, when you get close to them, they, uh, they, they move. Or the stone, uh, um, the works printed on marble or stone, you uh, kind of puzzled between what is the photograph and what are the real veins of the, of the stone. So um, I think, uh, for me, now that you know, we are in a world where images are uh, virtual and uh, everything is like dematerialized, I, I thought it was, uh, you know, interesting to um, work um, on, on in the opposite uh, direction. So um, this, um, I love to experiment also with. Um, um, with different materials. And my, my background is in uh, sculpture. At first, uh, textile design, but then I studied for many years sculpture in, um, in, uh, in London. And so I always worked with photography as a material to um, manipulate. I never thought of it as um, just an image. And also um, photography usually tends to be discussed in terms of uh, subject matter um, while I wanted to shift the, the attention also on its um, materiality. So turn the image into an object, I mean, still be dimensional, but maybe as you were saying, maybe, you know, fooling the eye um, a bit. And um, But it's so much more, I mean, you mentioned that when we talked before, it, it's so much more than simply fooling the eye. You know, we all know about this, this, this phenomenon of trompe l'oeil, you know, the idea of an, creating an illusion, especially in painting on a two-dimensional surface. But I think that you're tapping into something that's gone beyond that by focusing on the material itself, because it's not simply about fooling the eye, it's about creating, um, I guess, what, what we call in our history in a, in a sort of fancy way, an effective response, you know, this, this we're, 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 we're having a sort of emotional response um, of all of our senses to the material itself, um, not simply the illusion. And, and yeah. that's, it's, it's really a very interesting. interesting. In, in, a, in which context is it used, this, this idea in art history? Um, well, I think that's, it's a very, um, it's, nowadays talking especially about materials and this, this trend of, you know, interest in materiality. Um, and it comes to us, I think, theoretically through anthropology, um, this idea that objects have a kind of power or agency to um, make the viewer respond. Um, whereas, you know, if you took, look at traditional art history and really traditional um, study of any objects or works of art, uh, the, the 
agency or the power is, is, is usually thought of as one directional. You know, the, the viewer is the one creating meaning. Um, but again, there are these discourses that are going on, which are trying to reveal the fact that the materials themselves um, act somewhat independently on us without us even realizing that's the case. So it would be more, more the material than the iconography. Right, so. exactly, exactly. So, but you would apply that to, to discussion of painting as well? Or yeah, it, I mean, or I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that, especially as it relates to non-figural um, uh, scenes, um, you know, that the way in which ornament um, can, can also be a powerful means of communicating things like identity and um, status, uh, even to a certain extent, perhaps ideology. Um, you know, I, again, the focus is tra in traditional art history is always on the iconography. Um, yeah. you know, what is the symbol that's being conveyed? But again, what I find so interesting about your work is the way in which you focus on the fragments of the, of the scenes, um, which, uh, I mean, that was sort of another question I wanted to bring out in discussion is, is what you thought of the relationship between um, the sort of small fragment of the larger scene that, that you have chosen uh, and, and, and how you made the choice of, of, of what part of the whole to, to depict. Um, yeah. you know, and I don't wanna say that iconography isn't important, but I think there's so many more interesting things as, uh, to, to think about with regards to a, a work as well. Um, yes. Well, about the choice of the fragments, I think I, I select an object um, or a statue that catches the imagination. So it has, um, I have to reduce the subject to a, the, you know, this object to a, a detail, but this detail has to retain uh, enough, um, um, has to be suggestive enough to make you think of something else outside the, the frame of my selection. So it has to be, there has to be like, a, I don't know, an economy of means, but at the same time, it has to be like something that catches your, uh, your, your imagination. So um, it has to be just about revealing enough, uh, but not, uh, it never has any um, documentary um, intent. It's always uh, uh, something that should work as a as a hint, as a like a springboard for the for the imagination. I think. Right. Um, I mean, that's such an. Ex you're again. You're tapping into something that is almost elemental in the way that we perceive um, visual stimuli, and that that is something that again I think. Our historians for uh, since since the discipline was born have been struggling to understand why that is the case you know and and um it's it's so interesting to me to think about um how do i how do i reconcile as a scholar of of the ancient world when i look at your um works you know with the pieces from the uh, farnese bull um or the the tyrannicide so I, I know the reference and it's, but at the same time, I'm also drawn to its aesthetic value. It's, it's formal um, qualities, the material qualities. And so I have trouble reconciling the two a little bit, which is-, is So about what you know of the statue and what you're exactly, seeing. Exactly. Um, That's and, great. <laughs> I think that's probably what you intended, but um, but I think it's it's depending on who is looking, they might have a totally different response. Um, yes. So, I mean, would you argue for? Um, I mean, what's your feeling about the original, the reference, the 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 yes. ethnography, so to speak? A star, like a piece like the the Farnese ball when I first saw it I was amazed 
like uh, you know amazed that uh, you know it, it is an enormous uh, statues with the most complicated right. um, subject of uh, you know uh, bodies intertwined uh, uh, two men a woman a bull and then I was very amused by the fact that uh, centuries later other characters were added like right. dogs or like <laughs> a statue so it's a I mean it's an amazing piece of work that you realize it is meant to be looked at all angles and uh, the way I look at uh, sculpture is actually through the through the camera so I could um, can I say examine this uh, this piece by looking through the camera and therefore selecting just um, fragments uh, of, um, of it. And so I could, uh, um, they become quite unexpected uh, views because when I look at it, I am actually looking at the way maybe a hand is over a, a leg and then there is a, the, the bulls, uh, I, I don't know. It, I don't remember what the question was <laughs> actually. <laughs> I don't know if I answered. I'm not sure I'm, it's so much a question as just amusing on the relationship between the sort of, you know, what's being referred to and, and what it, the, the formal appearance or the sort of aesthetic power of the, of the material or the, the, the scene that you have selected. Um, you know, it's all, there's so many levels um, that you could go to to try to understand um, that work, and I, you know, I'm curious again about um, what whether that that original reference is important or whether it's it's simply that you're drawn to the. Um, I think it's not um, it's not particularly important the <clears throat> the, um, the original work because uh, I always. Uh, tend to work selecting one fragment of reality that it could be a statue but it could be a window or a reflection of the sun on like what's behind you it it is not um, that important what, what it is for me it's important to um, appropriate it and turn it into uh, into something else so the original meaning of the object or statue is um, totally lost, I think. I, I like to make something out of it. Um, but so, I mean, I think that for me, looking at your, the, the works on satin, for example, or the images of the Murano glass, it, to me that I don't have the burden of the iconography. So I can, I can, I can enjoy You're more free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, it is a funny thing to, to have that anchor of the meaning kind of weighing down um, the, the, the effect. I mean, I actually think it makes it more interesting for me to have the, the warring of the original reference with the aesthetic yeah. or effective response. Um, and in fact, I actually think that it's not an incompatible um, like not being interested in the iconography is not incompatible with its original um, context either, because I think it does come through the iconography. It somehow. does, it does, and and but but it isn't to say that everybody who looked at that image in the past would have known what they were looking at. Um, I mean, especially if you think about the fact that it was, um, I mean, the Farnese bull in particular that was found in the baths of Caracalla. Um, and I, I happen to think that maybe people were just really excited by the, the mass of bodies rolling around together, which would have made sense in the context of a gymnasium or, you know, a place where people wrestled. And, and so maybe they simply saw a kind of reflection of their own physical activity in stone. Um, so, you know, whether or not they knew that that was the myth of the punishment of Dursi, I mean, that really would have depended on a level of education. So I, yes. think, I think ultimately what is so interesting and wonderful about art, both in the contemporary and, and in, you know, any period are the multiplicities of meanings that we can tease out from them. 
Um, yeah. And um, I think, again, what, what's so, you know, what your interests and your particular um, focus on materials can do for us is, is, is actually open up other possibilities as well. Um, you know, once we, once we embrace the sort of original intention. Um, yeah. Which is kind of fun. I just realized that probably people that haven't seen the exhibition and doesn't know <laughs> my work, they probably have got no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that some of people are not. Maybe I should, I should explain uh, about some of some of the works that I, the way I, uh, what I made, the uh, photographs printed directly on marble or traver, travertine or travertine cover. Travertino, well, and they are um, details of um, ancient uh, uh, Roman uh, statues or sarcophagus. And then in the exhibition, there are other works uh, that are printed on satin, and they are they depict uh, um, an old uh, window from a Baroque palace, which is the Museum of Palazzo Madama. And the, the glass of the window um, makes the, can I say, it's a hand-blown glass, so it distorts the space you see through the window. And then you have, a, um, basically, the subject matter of my work coincide as much as possible with the material I'm, I'm using. So um, something made out of stone is printed on stone and uh, something like a, uh, the reflection of a window uh, would be printed on a, on satin that gives the same luminosity and fluidity and instability of a, of a reflection. And what Susanna has behind her is a, um, a reflection of the sun onto a wall and the highlights uh, um, I've painted the highlights with an opalescent uh, paint, so um, it looks like the light is emanating from the photograph. And it's printed on plasterboard to reference the fact that the subject matter is, um, is a wall. So it's uh, the photograph of a wall that goes back at being a, a wall, but then there is also this um, uh, light coming from the, the image. That's really, I mean, that's, um, that's such a fun idea of, 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 again, anchoring our view in a reference to the actual material. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it goes, I mean, how did you, how did that start for you? How did you, um, you know, come up with this, process? What was the sort of original impetus for it? I think I, well, since the beginning, I started to work with photography. I um, thought of combining it with the real, with something real. For many years, I worked with the um, light boxes that were, where the photograph was lit behind, just in a certain area. So it was um, painted with a black mask at the back and the light would only go through a certain area of the photograph. So there I already had, you know, uh, um, the representation and something real uh, interacting uh, with it. So that light, that electric light behind the photograph, you know, we perceive that through our senses, you know, in, in the present. Then I started to think about the display of photographs, the fact that we usually give the display for granted. They are actually either, I don't know, framed or mounted or published on a book or now dematerialized uh, virtual. But I, I always thought of working with the, with the real space um, of the gallery and so I started to make work uh, where the display of the photograph is part of the work. So you would have, I don't know, for instance, a photograph. There is one at the gallery there of a fabric uh, drapery with um, two nails going through the photograph. And the nails look like they're holding the drapery, but in fact, they're hanging the photograph 
against the wall. So there again, I had something real, the nail that was um, in, inside the representation as well. And then, then I was invited to do the um, project for this museum at Palazzo Madama. And I, I saw this you know, beautiful um, window and I started to photograph like hundreds and hundreds of photographs. And then I was thinking how this photograph uh, had to exist in the world, in, in, in reality. And then I first tried to print it on glass, thinking, well, this is a photograph of a window I'll print it on glass. But glass is actually a really dead and, and cold material and didn't give the, sense, the, the feeling of um, what I was looking at. And then I tried the satin. And then when I photographed those pieces behind you of the wall, I tried to print those on satin as well. And they were totally wrong because you had uh, the um, very straight lines of the architecture and the satin actually makes everything very fluid. And then I realized I had to go for a material that would be closer to the, to the subject matter. So I printed them on plasterboard. And then once I realized I could use a machine where you can put any material uh, through and print over it as an inkjet, uh, then I thought, oh, it would be great to try with them with stone. And then I started to think about what I could uh, photograph to print on stone. So I thought, I'm going to try and do uh, draperies of statues. So I went to the local monumental cemetery thinking, oh, that's the, you know, that's the best place, easy place to find a statue to photograph. And then I, um, I did a whole series of photographs that I never used. And then uh, uh, I got offered an exhibition in Naples in the Museo Pignatelli. And in Naples, there is one of the most amazing archeological museums. So of course I ended up there and uh, started to photograph. First I was there to photograph draperies. And then I was actually amazed by the bodies. So I ended up photographing lots of uh, bellies of Aphrodite, uh, heroes, tyrannicides, and and bits of um, Farnese bull and um, strigil. I would say strigil sarcophagus. Strigilated, yeah. Strigilated. Strigilat, yes. And uh, so now I forgot the question again that <laughs> you were asking me. Yeah, well, I forgot too because there's so many things. <laughs> So many, so many new questions that I have as I was listening to you speak. And I mean, the, starting with an observation, I, I really love the way that you talk about materials as if they're alive. Um, there's something that in the way that, that you, you, you refer to, I mean, I think you actually said glass is a kind of dead material. Um, and the way that we anthropomorphize the materials uh, is, is something interesting for me to think about. Um, and then I also really love the way that you talk about light as a kind of medium in and of itself. Um, yes. And you, you can see that you know, in, in, in your various works, the way that light, the light um, has, creates an effective response in us because it just, it looks that it's, it's alive, that it's moving and so on and so forth. So I'm not entirely sure what those two observations have um, in common, but I, 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 maybe I would ask you then, um, does that statement of, it seems like you think of the materials as, as somewhat alive, does that yes. resonate with you? Um, Very much so, but both, uh, uh, both what you're saying about light, because in fact, that's how I, always worked. I always, um, um, the reason why I started to work with photography, I think it's because I thought it was a great way to uh, work with, uh, with light. And, um, and the materials for sure has, makes the photograph alive some, somehow. Um, and 
for the satin, it's like physically they actually move. But, but the stone as well makes it, you know, uh, makes a fragment um, real again. Although we know it's bidimensional and, uh, you know, you know you're looking at uh, something flat, but um, the material itself, it's, um, it's alive. Well, that's, I mean, we, we spoke about that um, last week about the, the, I think in the ancient world, especially with marble um, and colored stone, there really was a per perception of these materials, I wouldn't, of being somewhat alive. I mean, marble itself, the word marble comes from a word that means to shine in Greek. Um, and this idea of something that that shines out is, is a very um, active uh, meaning. And I think that, um, you know, there's also, especially in the period of time that I work on in late antiquity, there are a number of discussions about being able to see images and, and see um, movement in, in the lines of marble, um, especially again, the colored marbles that you find. But what puzzles me is that then uh, why were the statues um, painted? I mean, the fact of painting them, it actually um, disguised the, the material. So you, I don't know how much of the marble would uh, come through once the statue, were they completely painted or just the, if you, they had like clothed women, but the heroes, like they would, not be painted. I, I don't know. I'm a bit confused. With it's, well, I mean, the truth is, is we don't know for sure um, what what degree of, say, a marble statue of an Aphrodite, or or even that, you know, let's say the Farnese bull. How much of that would have been painted? Probably, certainly, there would details of clothing and jewelry and that kind of stuff would would be would be um, highlighted uh, to to bring them out. And I think that it's not actually incompatible. The stone, because if you think about the way that even today painters prime a canvas with with white or gesso, um, yes. and, or even you know old master oil paintings, the idea is that the light sort of comes through from the white comes through from behind, or the the the, the light reflect, reflects or refracts the oil, the colors um, through the oil. Um, so the marble itself understood as a kind of um, a kind of stone that has a um, a power or a, a visual a visual um, power. Even if it was covered in paint, it would still it was it was still the foundation for for the for the lifelikeness of the object. I mean, it really is all about lifelikeness. I mean, I think that was the thing that um, ultimately uh, what we learn about reading ancient authors on sculpture is the desire to bring out the lifelikeness of the, of the image. Um, and especially if it was in the context of a sacred space of some kind. Um, and we often forget that I think looking at ancient sculpture in museums um, because so, so many objects that we revere as sort of purely beautiful from a kind of modern perspective were, were images that, that had a, a very different life. Um, and I, I use life here very specifically because some of these images were, were thought to be living things, living beings or um, manifestations of the deities that they were depicted. Um, not always the case. I mean, I doubt that that Farnese bull was, was thought to, you know, be a manifestation of the actual figures because it was, you know, it was in a, it was in a bathhouse, basically. Um, maybe it's a, the original image um, because that was a, the, the bull that we have in Naples today, which was found in Rome, was a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And you know, the Romans were just copying all over the place. Um, but I think the origin, <laughs> the original was, was a living thing or thought of as a living thing. So all that to say, I mean, I really, again, the, the, the resonance of talking about materials themselves as being living 
is, is not incompatible, I think, again, with, with um, how people understood uh, works of art in, in the past. Um, and I think we often spend a lot of time trying to talk about how contemporary art is, is so different or, or uh, so, so di divorced in some, some way from the past. But, um, you know, I'm biased being a classicist. I, I, I wish that we actually spent more time kind of bringing the, the ideas together a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think it would be great. And for sure, it's the way I look at art. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, interested in like uh, art of any ages. Of course, I see it through contemporary eyes and uh, I understand that it, it is very misleading the way I look at um, ancient sculpture. That oh, not at all, actually, that's, that was the absolute opposite of what I was trying to convey. As no, I no, I, 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 I understand, but uh, I have always feel maybe a bit guilty that the fact that I am totally ignoring what the original meaning might have been for, for the ancient people. The fact that because they are very naturalistic, then I, I can see them, you know, as, a, as if they were like a, um, in con contemporary, but not only that, that, as if they were bodies, basically. But, right. Um, well, don't feel, please don't feel guilty because it's the, the I think the opposite of what we, we should feel is is recognizing that works of art have multiple meanings, you know, that, that they're not fixed and that, you know, um, that, that, and I, why I like, I really love your work in particular is the way that for me, it, it brings up multiple um, references. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 I think also the 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 way in which that your work evokes the process itself is also quite exciting because I think that um, you know so often um, we forget how much work goes into uh, making uh, something so um, because we're f fixated really only on its 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 beauty or its yeah. um, uh, uh, you know its its aesthetic value but in fact. Um, you know, something can often fool us into looking like it's it's without effort, but actually a tremendous. Yeah, I love that the fact that <laughs> I get crazy to get like works, you know, exact as I want them, and then you look at them and it looks like they, you know, they they always been like that. They, um, I mean, I just keep thinking, how did you get that? How did you get a big slab of marble onto a printer? <laughs> you know, that's just one of those things. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? You froze for a second. Okay, I froze a little bit too. Um, I was just thinking again about the amount of effort that goes into these, the works that you make. And, and in particular, I think about how hard it must have been to get a, a, a slab of marble onto <laughs> a printer. Um, <laughs> and That's a great thing of working in Italy. Yeah. Oh no. Did you? So you can actually try and print a, uh, you know, I have the best uh, printers here and best marble fabricators and they are all very willing to experiment and, and try to get things uh, uh, right. So and I'm very, very lucky. May I ask what you're working on now? Now I just, I just sent to New York the works for my next exhibition that opens on the 4th of December at 55 Walker with the um, Bortolami, Kaufman, Repetto and Andrew Krebs. And these are works uh, on satin that are photographs of um, a plastic sheet covering um, a window backlit. And, uh, Behind these plastic sheets, there might be objects uh, uh, hiding uh, or curtains hiding. So basically you, ha you have the photograph of the plastic on the picture plane, and then there's another space behind made out, out of light and vague objects that you can't see. Um, and the show is going to be with Carla Cardi, who 
was a, an abstract painter from Italy and she painted on transparent uh, plastic for a few years of uh, her career. And so there is a relationship between her transparent backgrounds and my photographs of plastic. There is one uh, uh, behind there, I don't know if you can see it, but a bit far away. Um, so I just finished uh, that and, and now then I have to, uh, I don't know, work on another, start something else, we'll, we'll what, see. Uh, what material should you have in, haven't you uh, <laughs> uh, thought about yet? I don't know. Um, I don't know, if you get any ideas. <laughs> well, I, to say, I mean, I, I, I've been oddly enough thinking a lot about cement lately because there's so, cement. Much, of it, yeah, there's so much of it here in Hong Kong, um, but it's also, again, it's so connected to Roman building and, and the, 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 the architecture of the Roman Empire that uh, I wonder about whether it's possible, but it's also so ugly, cement. C cement is like one of those things that, that um, yeah. is not always, doesn't have the same aesthetic uh, joy that marble or travertine or satin brings to us. Um, yes, uh, uh, but what are you working on? Oh, me, I'm just trying to, trying to write my book, <laughs> finish my book. <laughs> What is the book? Uh, what What is it about the book? Oh um, well, it's as as Fabio said. I'm I'm writing about uh, visual culture in late antique Egypt, but it's centered around this archaeological project that I've been involved with for um, a little over ten years now. And um, no, God, sorry, more than that. What is 2015? <laughs> sorry, fifteen years now. Um, and they they they've discovered. Um, it's, we sometimes call it the Pompeii of Egypt, um, perhaps aspirationally, but there's a number of um, painted houses there with these really uh, very poor quality paintings, but really interesting imagery. And um, so I'm trying to kind of understand what they're doing in the middle of the desert. Um, I hope book. there will be a lot of pictures in your book. Yeah, yes, I've, I've been meaning to send you some actually, because I think that, um, these are the ones that really got me thinking about um, the way in which materials dialogue with each other, um, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a single work, um, you know, and, and this idea of, of, of the, the effective response, you know, how are we supposed to look at these images and what, what is the what is the response that we are supposed to, to have in, in seeing these, these incredible ornamental imagery? But as, as contemporary or the ancient uh, one day? Well, it's, it's always really through our own eyes, ultimately. You know, I can pretend to say I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to understand what the ancient person thought, but the reality is, is that we're, we're so, you know, I have a, a contemporary lens that is built into my, my thinking. So, um, but this is ultimately the difficult thing about talking about any art from non-contemporary context is, is acknowledging the bias that we have while also trying to get at something objective. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know yes. if it's possible or not. Yes. Are we at? And yes, I think we're out of now. time. Um, um, anybody has questions? Okay. <laughs> um, yes, um, any questions, I think. And uh, if anybody have questions in the Zoom, you can put it in the chat and then we can see it if you have no. any questions. You know, no worries. So, no, oh, sorry, no, sorry. Just, um, no worries. No, I have another place wanna... to see the okay, chat okay. if there's any questions. Yeah. Um, I actually have a question, question yeah. for you, Elisa. What's, yes. the, what's the most difficult medium you, you've worked with? Or is there any media, is there any material that you started working on and then you decided that's not for me i cannot work on that oh i i tried to print on them um... i want to hear your failures <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, tried to, I printed on uh, glass i only did one work that exists and then i i didn't like it because oh. Oh. Uh, for all these new works of Photographs of plastic, of course, I try to print on plastic, right. nylon, all sorts of uh, 
and it was really horrible and didn't work at all and gave up on the of the materials i've used uh, the most difficult one is uh, white marble because when you print on it every uh, the slightest percentage of color mm. turns the um, photograph either pinkish or greenish or bluish uh, to get that um, uh, to get the feeling that the print is not attached to the stone but that the it's the stone that it's organizing itself into right. a, an image so that that the two are totally uh, together uh, for something that white it is really difficult so a few times we had to set, put the same slab uh, in the machine uh, two times or three times to just adjust the 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 colors. How many how many works have you made on the marble until you've gotten one that you actually like, or that's the one? You know, what I mean, how many how many pieces? Have I, you I don't know, maybe two. But some sometimes we print it and then I got the slab back to the marble uh, person <laughs> to get it. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. And then, uh, print again, but then we, you know. We're very stubborn, so we do get what <laughs> we want at the end. Well, that answers my question. I was going to ask you how you, like, if, if, if you didn't like it, was it possible to remove the image? So I guess you have to say, you would just yes. say it. Wow. Yeah. I only did it, I only did it once because it was such an asshole to, <laughs> to <get laughs> it back and print again. But, um, yes. Can you? 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 Can um, so I really like the layers within your work that you built and I think it's about like illusions of illusion because those sculptures are created like idealized bodies and uh, is in a way it's kind of um, re representing reality in the same time and you create another illusion on top of that and I think the very interesting fact that you use photography also capture like the details of the marble, sometimes the cracks and that kind of pull you back to the reality. And, and I, I really like that kind of um, like you, the viewers kind of, um, kind of uh, flow in between the idea of reality and illusion. And uh, so, yeah, I, I really love your work. And I just have a very simple question. I noticed all your works are untitled. Is there any intention behind not giving a, a textual meaning to your work? That's it. I, I like the idea of leaving them untitled because I don't want to suggest or impose any readings on them. I often notice that if you give a title, then uh, um, people start <clears throat> wondering more about the title and the relationship between the title and the, the artwork. Um, <clears throat> so they are untitled not to fix um, a meaning. But at the same time, you need a way to distinguish, to categorize, distinguish one piece to the other. So um, the easiest way I could find is to, since they're digital photographs, the numbers are the numbers of the original file. So, um, and they are um, unique pieces. So um, that is, you know, their title. And uh, it is very, uh, very straightforward. But I'm, uh, thank you very much for your question. I'm very happy that you enjoy the work. <laughs> All right, I think this is uh, towards the end of our talk. Thank you so much, Elisa, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been um, great.
Facebook to Susanna and to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's been right. such a pleasure talking to you. Uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah, yeah definitely. That, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us online, and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.